You're listening to Witch Wednesdays, your weekly podcast source for all things witchcraft in the modern world. Welcome back to Witch Wednesdays. I'm Steph, and I have a special guest here with me today to chat about uh, a fun topic and all of sort of what she offers in that realm. So I am going to go ahead and let her introduce herself and tell you where you can find her online. Thanks so much, Steph. My name's Annabella, and I'm the mental health witch. Um, so I have about 15 years experience in psychology. So I'm actually a tertiary qualified counsellor. And I've worked in a range of different counselling settings like crisis counselling in mental health education all around Australia, which you can probably tell by my accent. Um, and now I actually work in, in social media and marketing of mental health. So I try and use like digital marketing for good um, to promote mental health. And I've been a witch for about 20 years now as well. So I've been looking at how to combine those practices because I found even with my own personal experiences with mental health, you know, having had anxiety, depression, um, PTSD, and a whole range of other mental health issues throughout my life, that a lot of those treatments and a lot of the things that I did were really lacking a spiritual element. And so I've kind of taken a path where I'm combining psychology and spirituality or psycho-spirituality in new and different and interesting ways. And you can find out more about me and get in touch with me through the, the mentalhealthwitch.com. That is great. And your website, I just have to say, for somebody who does help people with this and has a business, you offer so much free stuff. Like you have all kinds of free guides and great blog posts, like so much free information you have to share, which I really appreciate that if not everything is, you know, hidden behind a paywall. Thank you. Yeah, it's at, my mission is all about promoting good mental health and well-being. Um, and I've worked a lot with um, a whole range of different people, um, mostly with people who are considered marginalized or have a lot of difficulties accessing traditional services. So this is really a passion project for me. Um, I'm here about edu to educate people about mental health rather than to you know, charge exorbitant psychology fees or anything like that. For me, the best psychology material needs to be easy to understand. You know, it shouldn't contain jargon. It should be simple. It should make sense. It should be practical. It needs to work. And that's also why I love witchcraft so much because witchcraft is those things, you know, it's, it's free. You don't need to spend thousands of dollars on crystals. You can use a rock you found at the beach. And it's very much, you know, effectiveness is a measure of truth. It has to work. So I, these things actually go together naturally really, really well. Yeah, I, they definitely do. I think people are sometimes suspicious of witchcraft and think that spirituality and science have no place, you know, together, but they really do meld together really well. Um, and I feel like it's more, you know, whole or well-rounded recovery uh, if you combine those things together. That's right. Um, they're there's so much, um, I'm a very evidence-based, science-based person um, because I am working in the psychology field as a professional. You know, the evidence base and having a scientific basis for everything I do is so important to me. And I apply that to my spiritual practices as well. So all of my witchy, pagany and spiritual practices that I do, like understanding how the brain works and how they're beneficial for you psychologically just enriches the whole experience. Um, so for example, like as a, as a dancer, like I really understand when I reach that state of flow in dance and I reach a level of trance, whether I'm dancing to honor a different deity or goddess, um, or, you know, just having some fun and jamming with friends, I really understand what's going on in my brain. And then, you know, being able to tie in psychic experiences or trance experiences just completely elevates that experience for me. So I don't really see them as being separate. Um, because when you start to explore the brain and look at even mental health issues, healing from mental health issues, and even just, you know, having great well-being, spirituality is something that has always been really tied in with the evidence base for resilience, for being able to bounce back from all those stresses and life problems that we all inevitably have. Now, I have found a lot of witches who, you know, submit comments and feedback about the podcast, experiencing a lot of anxiety, a lot of depression. Obviously, a lot of that comes from the pandemic and the things that we have all experienced in our lives in the last couple of years is like 
nothing that we've ever had to deal with before. So I completely understand where that's coming from. But do you think that witches maybe are more in tune with their mental health and these feelings because they are witches and they are just more in tune with nature are getting to know themselves a little bit better? Do you think that that is why they are noticing that they need to take care of their mental health too? Absolutely. Being a witch is kind of like having this superpower because you need a level of reflection and insight in order to do witchcraft really well. Like it requires, you know, a lot of witches do meditations and things like that, do journaling and do all sorts of things where they're connecting with their body and with nature. And that means that you're more open to noticing when things are out of balance. You notice when things are out of balance in nature and also in ourselves. I think that's an excellent point. <laughs> that the idea of balance is really important. And I think it's something that, you know, the more you work on the witchcraft side of things, the more you realize how much it ties into everything and how important that balance ends up being. So if somebody were sort of just starting, they were just starting into witchcraft and realizing that this mental health aspect has been coming up, maybe anxiety, maybe depression, where would you recommend that they start when they're trying to deal with those overwhelming feelings? Uh, well, actually, I'd like to talk through a little bit about your brain and what's going on in a witchy way, um, because I've found that, you know, psychology can be complex and it can even be, dare I say it, like boring. I know some people <laughs> don't find it that interesting, uh, which as a, like someone who works in psychology is always a surprise to me, but <laughs> I really like to make it fun and interesting and super relevant because there's nothing better than learning more about yourself. So a place to start, something I would really recommend is starting to educate and learn a little bit more about your psychology. And we can do a little tiny bit right now, if that's okay, talk through I some guess. of our brain and what's going on. <laughs> Excellent. So I want to talk about three or four different parts of your brain starting with what I call your inner huntress. So I like to tie in archetypes and goddesses because it's just so juicy and so much more interesting than talking about, you know, like the amygdala or something like that. Um, but when you think about your inner huntress, she's the first part of your brain. She's kind of the brain stem, which is where your, your brain and spine connect. And she's really about survival. And that's why I call her your huntress and not say your warrior, because, you know, a hunter is all about getting food, staying safe, protecting themselves. And they're very much out in nature. They're moving around a lot. They know the power of stillness and silence. So they're doing whatever needs to be done to stay alive. And that brainstem part of our brain, which is the first part to both have evolved and also to develop, is actually all about survival. So it controls your heart rate, your breath, your sleep, your digestion, just the basic physiological things that help keep you alive. That inner huntress actually connects to what's known as your limbic system. Sometimes people call it your emotional brain. I'm going to call it your inner mermaid. I'm <laughs> a big fan of your inner mermaid um, because she's the emotional part of us. So she loves pleasure. She seeks out pleasure and she doesn't like pain. So it's something she tries to avoid. And this part of your brain is your, you might have heard, some people know a little bit more about the brain and some people don't, and that's okay. But it's a part of your brain that's like your hypothalamus, your hippocampus, your amygdala. So it controls your emotions. It controls your learning and your danger alert system. And it's, you know, it's acting as this really powerful link between the lower and higher parts of your brain. So your, your inner mermaid, you know, I call her that because she is a bit of a drama queen. So she's kind <laughs> of like you know, a teenage drama queen. Um, so she can go a bit over the top sometimes. But she's also a lot of fun. You know, she makes life meaningful and juicy and interesting. Then you have your inner queen and your inner queen is your frontal lobe um, or sometimes called your neocortex. And it's at the front, very front. It's the last thing to evolve and develop. And the reason why she's the queen, right, is because she's very much about solving problems, critical thinking, planning, communicating. So she does all like the big boss CEO kind of stuff. Um, she doesn't leave that in the hands of the, the mermaid or the huntress. The huntress is kind of like that on the ground. And the huntress is feeding information to the mermaid. So the huntress doesn't have a lot of context. You know, she's getting all these senses through the five senses. She's getting information and she's constantly feeding it to the inner mermaid to get meaning because emotions give meaning to what's going on for us. And then the inner mermaid is 
communicating that to the queen, who is then kind of filtering through and making decisions based on the information she's getting. And what actually happens is stress is something that I think underlines a lot of mental health issues, even just not feeling so great, you know, even having a bit of burnout at work, feeling anxious, feeling depressed, a lot of it comes back to that experience of stress. So two really important things to know about stress is the first is that your brain can't actually tell the difference between danger and stress. So when our brain evolved, you know, back in caveman days, if we want to call it that, or you know, back in prehistory, we didn't really have things like mean bosses, too much uni homework to do and that kind of thing. We only had physical danger. So this part of our brain evolved to respond to danger and it has this really great response, but it doesn't really fit a modern stress environment. So our brain can't tell the difference between danger and stress. It also can't tell the difference between real stress or real danger and stuff we imagine in our head. As far as psychology is concerned, if you imagine having a fight with your partner, for instance, the same parts of your brain light up as if you actually had a fight with your partner. If you imagine biting into an apple, the same parts of your brain light up as if you actually bit into an apple. So our brain can't tell the difference between what's real and what we're imagining. So when stress happens, yeah, normally our mermaid, our queen and our huntress work really well together. They function quite well. They get through the day. Stress goes up and down a little bit and it doesn't really affect them. But the problem happens when you experience a lot of stress, severe stress, chronic stress, when you're overwhelmed, your ability to cope is overwhelmed. And that results in some different neurotransmitters. So neurotransmitters are chemical messengers in your brain and hormones are chemical messengers in your blood. So what happens is if stress starts to rise and it goes beyond our kind of happy threshold for stress, it releases things like adrenaline and cortisol, which are muscle activators. So they're kind of sending this message to our inner huntress that we need to be fast and strong because we might need to have this fight, flight, freeze response, which is that danger response that evolved before we had things like modern day stress. So basically, if the huntress gets the message that there might be a, like a bear around waiting to attack you or something like that, she's going to fight it off, run away, or she might freeze because she's a huntress, right? She's good at being still and hiding or waiting to see what's going to happen before she makes a response. So what happens is your inner huntress picks up that stress is happening. She sends that message up to your inner mermaid and your inner mermaid is responsible for sounding the alarm. So if she thinks that the stress is too much and she's interpreting stress as danger, she might sound the alarm. And unfortunately, that results in our queen literally evacuating the castle. Like she actually goes temporarily offline and gets out of there for a little while. And the reason for that is because that part of our brain is so energy hungry that if the queen was there, you know, trying to problem solve um, or critically think her way out of a situation where a bear is coming up to her, like she doesn't have the time. She needs to make a split second decision. And the huntress is very good at that. So the queen pretty much evacuates the castle and leaves the mermaid in charge of making decisions along with the huntress. And that works really well for danger because we're able to make these fast split second decisions and they're very automatic to these decisions. But these aren't so good if we're really stressed out. You know, it's not really good if your queen who controls communication decides to abandon you while you're on stage giving a speech. Or it's not very good if your queen who is in charge of problem solving and critical thinking decides to abandon you when you need to work out a really stressful work situation. So we have this this response that's kind of going against us because it was designed when we were living in prehistory before we had all of these modern day stresses. And it's like, we haven't got the latest upgrade or update in order to help us manage. And what ends up happening is that if you end up in that high state of stress and stresses in your body, you end up also having other effects which become anxiety. And anxiety is when like that threshold for stress just gets raised and raised and raised. And your new normal is a really high level of feeling like you're constantly in danger, having your queen constantly missing in action, having your inner mermaid making some very emotional decisions 
kind of in a teenage mindset and your huntress making some, you know, responding to all this, all of these neurotransmitters and hormones flooding through your body. And what happens is that often when people are anxious, that's a really high energy state to be in. It, it takes a lot of mental energy and a lot of physical energy. And people find that they end up feeling depressed because depression from an evolutionary perspective is using the least amount of energy needed to survive. So it's about recharging your batteries. So a lot of people find that they cycle through anxiety and depression to varying degrees because they're actually, their body's, you know, existing in this really high energy state. And then they're cycling back down to try and recharge their battery in a depressed state. And once that battery is recharged, they end up going back to their new normal threshold of anxiety, which is much higher than it should be. And it becomes this vicious cycle. That is probably the single best explanation I have ever heard of how this loop of stress works and how your brain works. And I am forever going to remember the huntress, the mermaid, and the queen now every time that happens. Um, (laughs) That is so interesting, so easy to remember. Um, And obviously simplifies the science down a lot for those of us who are not in the field, but hits all of those basic points that are so important. And that is the best explanation I've ever heard. That was great. I'm sure the listeners are going to love that as much as I did. (laughs) So given all of that and how many people are in that cycle right now and operating at that high anxiety level, how can they use witchcraft to help them get out of that cycle? Ah, uh, that's we're up to my favorite bit. Yes. <laughs> um, I had so, a favorite. <laughs> <laughs> so there's so many different ways witchcraft helps with both anxiety, depression, and other kinds of mental health issues as well. I like to talk about bringing in the priestess. So if you know we have our, our huntress, our mermaid, and our queen. But when I think about our priestess, or, you know, you can call whatever you want, sorceress, um, you know, whatever term you most relate to, there's lots of ways that we can really connect with her and get a lot of healing in our brain. So some ways that she kind of helps, um, I'm going to jump to the more extreme, then we'll go back to the simple, (laughs) is that when we look at brainwaves, so when your queen, your mermaid and your huntress are working together as like this dream team, this trio, whether you're anxious or not, whether you're just problem solving and concentrating, you're kind of in this beta um, state of brainwave state. So that's the state we exist in most of the time. But our brain has actually been designed to have all kinds of interesting and mystical experiences. You know, that's why we have things like different drugs bind to different receptors in our brains and cause all sorts of um, like interesting things happening. Um, So we can have these kinds of experiences through witchcraft and they're incredibly healing. Um, So things like meditation and trance, which can take you through a whole range of different brain waves, like from alpha, which is associated with light meditation and is like the brainwave state that you need for psychic abilities to really come to the forefront. You've got theta, which is all about your third eye, that kind of brainwave state where you're daydreaming, you're not really aware of the outside world, you're finding your flow. So if you're in a state of flow, like if you're dancing or painting or doing something you love and you kind of forget about the outside world, that's a theta brain state. And then you've got those deeper, like delta, which is kind of that deep hypnosis, deep sleep, really healing for the body state of being, as well as gamma, which is at the other end of the spectrum, but it's um, very common in people who do a lot of... um, transcendental, compassionate, loving meditations. Um, So all of these brain states are really healing and you can enter them in a whole range of different ways through witchcraft. So one of my favorites, as I've mentioned, is through dance and trance dance. And um, I've been a a belly dancer for pretty much as long as I've been a witch. So I've had my fair share of experiencing different kinds of um, trance states through dance. And there's lots of other ways to enter trance as well. Some people find that drumming works for them. different kinds of meditations and stuff like that. So that's one way we can actually kind of connect with that priestess, that sorceress, even, you know, that goddess, whatever sort of archetype or or goddess you most associate with that state of being, that can be incredibly healing. But there are lots of other ways as well. So 
ritual is a really amazing way to connect with witchcraft and to really work with your mental health. Um, so ritual has a lot of interesting research behind it. So it's um, something that when people do ritual, because it's a repeated thing, we feel safe. Our brain is designed to see repetition and the familiar as being safe. And we see things that are new or different as potentially being dangerous, but also being exciting because excitement and anxiety are different sides of the same coin when it's not too severe. So ritual has this incredible ability to make you feel safe. And it actually has this um, way to connect you with your senses as well, because ritual is so beautiful, like something that's really enjoyable and it puts you in the moment. So a lot of people might have heard like the idea of mindfulness um, or being in the moment as being something that can be really helpful for anxiety in particular, because anxiety is a bit of a time traveler. You know, she can go to the past and think about that thing that you did that you regret having done and you feel so ashamed about three weeks ago. Or she can travel to the future and picture everything that might go wrong on your upcoming holiday or next week when you have a really stressful week. So she's constantly traveling back and forth, but your body's always in the present moment. And ritual really grounds you in that present moment. And rituals are so simple. You know, it can be drinking herbal tea. It could be showering by candlelight. It could be using sacred oils and anointing yourself with them, all that kind of thing. And then we have spells and chants, which I consider a little bit separate. Because I feel like spells and chants, like rituals can be about anything. Where spells and chants for me in particular, as a person with anxiety, I find them so in the moment because you can be completely unprepared and make up a little chant in your head and it can act as like a positive reframe. Because when you're creating a little chant or you're focusing on something, you're actually focusing on what you want to attract rather than your fear. So if you're worried about something, like let's say you're waiting at the doctor's surgery, for instance, to get some results and you're feeling quite anxious, if you make up a little chant in your head, it doesn't even have to rhyme about, you know, getting good results and the wait time not taking too long or something like that. You're actually focusing on and attracting what you want rather than going down this negative spiral of anxiety around what you're scared about might happen. The other thing I really like is that you can actually use spells to hand your concerns over to the divine, whatever the divine means for you. So it's about... Um, sort of surrendering. So if you do a spell about money, because you're worried about money, you're actually surrendering that over to the design, divine. You're kind of like saying, hey, um, I have this problem, but rather than ruminating on it and getting stuck on it, I'm going to take a physical action to manifest what I want. And then I'm going to hand it over and see what happens. So they're just some little ways that mental health and doing like simple witchcraft practices can really be connected and make a big difference to your well-being. I love that you touched on the uh, everything across the board of how long it could possibly take because you know belly dancing could take a while whereas sipping a cup of tea is very quick. So I appreciate that your list is not, you know, things that take a lot of time <laughs> because I know that's something that adds to a lot of our anxiety and stress is just this time crunch that we all feel that there's just mm -hmm. so much going on and so much to consume and just not enough time in the day to feel like you can incorporate witchcraft or any sort of practice to help you deal with stress and anxiety, which of course just leads back into the spiral over and over again. So it's great that you mentioned some of those really quick tips because those are important too. It doesn't have to be an elaborate ritual every time. Absolutely. And if you have particular interests like herbal magic or kitchen witchery is absolutely fabulous for depression in particular, because you're also healing your body with plants, right? Like, so um, one of the causes, possible causes of depression that affects modern women, modern mystical women is that, and there's lots of co potential causes of depression. That's why it's so complex, but one is around nutrition. Like we need a really nutrient rich diet. And something that a lot of people don't realize is that this really important neurotransmitter in depression, which is the basis of antidepressant medication, it's called serotonin, and it's responsible for balancing your mood and helping different parts of your brain talk to each other. It's actually created mostly in the gut. So 90% of serotonin, which is needed by your brain to not feel depressed, 
is created in your digestive system. So when you start getting into things like herbs and kitchen witchcraft and stuff like that and working with nature and plants, um, even spending time, you know, outside in nature itself is a very healing thing for depression, spending time in the sun, exercise, all of those things have been shown to be as effective as different kinds of medication for stuff like depression. And then when you bring in stuff around, you know, using supplementing with herbs and using herbs in your everyday life as part of your witchcraft practice, um, or being a kitchen witch and spending time in the kitchen, cooking up beautiful meals, which also is a very mindful practice as well you're tying in this level of physical healing because, you know, we've got this body, mind and soul and the mind sits in the middle of that. It's really hard if to have this spiritual connection if your mind isn't doing so great because it's in the middle for a reason. It connects the two. And we aren't really like, I, people kind of think sometimes that we're like, um, you know, brains with bodies attached. But it's that idea of like, you know, we're spiritual being, we're like spiritual beings, but we're having this physical experience and we're actually bodies with a brain. So our brain is biological. It's not just our thoughts. Our thoughts are a reflection of what's going on in our world. They're, they're definitely affected by different kinds of physical things that are happening to our body and different kinds of, you know, food that we're eating, the stress that we're experiencing, whether we're getting enough sleep or not, all of those things have this profound impact on your brain and on your mental health. So a lot of witchcraft too is actually just being like coming back to that nature idea. It's being in rhythms with nature. And it's kind of acknowledging that we live in this society that's very much go, go, go all the time. We're rushing about, but nature has seasons. It has patterns. It has rhythms. And our body has those rhythms. You know, even hormones affect our mental health. At certain times of the month, we feel cranky. And progesterone is like a, a hormone that is released at different times of our menstrual cycle for those who menstruate. And it's something that you know, can actually make you feel depressed. Or on the positive, a flip side, it actually can make you feel calm. So estrogen has the opposite effect where it makes you feel excited and it makes you feel busy and sociable and you want to get like lots of stuff done and spend all this time with your family and friends and everything's really interesting and pleasure is so much more pleasurable. But on the flip side, because anxiety and excitement are linked, high estrogen in different parts of your cycle can make some people feel more anxious and it can affect your sleep and that kind of thing. So we have our own natural cycles in our body. And that's regardless of if you're menstruating or not as well. You know, all people have their own natural cycles. Nature has its cycles. And being a witch means honoring those cycles and having a time to look after yourself, having time to nourish yourself, having time to rest, having time to have high energy and high activity and get excited and get pumped and see your friends. So a lot of it just comes back to those basics. I mean, that's what self-care is. This idea of self-care gets tossed around a lot. And it's often connected with making money, right? Like it, it, people are like self-care, expensive face mask or <laughs> self-care, you know, buy whatever this product is that I'm trying to sell you, hashtag me time. <laughs> but um, actually the reality is that self-care is about living in balance with nature. It's about having a time to sleep, having a time to exercise and spend time outside and in nature, having time to rest and sit down, having time to nourish yourself. All of that stuff is fundamental stuff for for witches and spiritual pagany women <laughs> <laughs> and and self-care you know can be simple too I think when the, the height of Instagram is I complain about this a lot but it's such a problem seeing all the like elaborate rituals and tools and everything that witches have which looks beautiful on Instagram but that's sort of like the purpose of it and they're like oh you know self-care is building this great altar that works for some people but that's not self-care if you don't have the finances for it if you don't have the time or energy to upkeep that it's okay to not have the tools and focus on the very small aspects of self-care that are just nourishing your body and sleeping and exercising those very minute details add up into this whole picture of health and really all go together, balance together. That's right. And it's a simple things, like one of my favorite things. And I tell this to a lot of people and the amount of people that have come up and grabbed me and been like, Annabella, you have changed my life with this thing <laughs> is just showering by candlelight. Like rather than having a bright light on in your bathroom when you're showering, 
get a cheap candle, light it, and just have candlelight. It's amazing how much that transforms yes. your experience. Like it makes the shower a ritual rather than it being like this quick rush thing that you're doing, like, like a deer in the headlights sort of experience. Um, so there's just so many little things that you can do that should not cost you money or cost you very little money and shouldn't really cost you much time either. You know, for me, bedtime is having a shower by candlelight, which I have to shower anyway, so I'm not taking any extra time. I create an anointing oil, a sacred oil, which I'll devote to different goddesses. And, you know, that doesn't have to be an expensive thing. You can use olive oil from the kitchen. You might put a drop or two of lavender oil in it, and that's your oil. And anointing that mindfully, you know, touching that to my third eye, rubbing it in my hands, taking a moment to smell it, um, doing that before bed and then just having a cup of tea like no tech just turn that off sometimes sit with a book or just with my own thoughts and have a cup of tea and I always tell people as well that even if you have no tools or you're in a bad state like you know you're on the bus you're really stressed out and you don't have anything that you need right then and there to do a ritual you have this amazing tool your imagination and you know you're those different, um, like your mermaid, your queen, and your priestess, they love your imagination. This idea of, um, you know, people often think that disconnecting through things like gaming, reading books, um, that kind of thing isn't necessarily good for you. Like this escapism, like there's this little bit of a myth that like, oh, escapism is bad. But actually the research shows that using your imagination, daydreaming, connecting with things you enjoy, regardless of whether they're what modality they take. So it doesn't matter if you like gaming, you like anime, you like reading books, you like binge watching Netflix, whatever that might be. Having that obviously within you know, moderation and within boundaries, but having that level of escapism and imagination is actually really powerful. And it actually help, teaches people a whole range of different skills and helps them have empathy and helps them solve problems in really creative ways. Because when we use our imagination, we're tapping into play and we're tapping into that entire mythical landscape of different gods and goddesses and archetypes and that kind of thing. Our brain loves to imagine stuff. So I would say that even if you have absolutely no tools whatsoever, or you're, you know, a closeted witch, you can't be out in the open, you can use your imagination. You can sit down for 10 minutes and you can do that anywhere and just imagine yourself completing a ritual. Imagine yourself casting a spell. Having a physical, like casting a spell physically is wonderful and it's really anchoring and it's great for manifesting, but you can just do something just as easily using your imagination. Like you said at the very beginning of this, your brain doesn't know the difference of whether you are actually casting that ritual or it's just your imagination. Your brain perceives that in exactly the same way. So that's a great tip, um, great advice for people who can't practice out in the open for whatever reason, whether they just don't want to um, or would like to keep things minimal or if they can't or around people who aren't accepting of that. That's a great tip. That's right. And that's, you know, you can use that for all kinds of things, witchcraft practices as well. You know, a lot of um, glamour magic. I'm a big fan of glamour magic where I kind of embody different energies. So if I need the energy of Aphrodite for whatever reason, I'll embody that energy. And I do that through decoration, it's probably because I'm a dancer, but, you know, I have to <laughs> going on stage is a scary thing. It doesn't matter how many times I do it, but I use costumes to make myself feel whatever energy I need to feel for that dance. And then through that, that embodiment, I become that for a time. So you can even use that imaginative aspect to embody different types of archetypes, goddess energies, or whatever you need. And you can make that a part of your everyday too. So, you know, if you're getting ready to go to work, you don't have much time, you're in a rush, but putting on your earrings could be something symbolic of embodying a particular energy, whatever energy you need for that day. So you can connect all these different kinds of mental practices with physical things that you already have. And what's really cool about these mental practices is that in the world of sports psychology, which sounds a bit weird, but go with me, <laughs> they've actually done a whole heap of research about this, the fact that your brain can't tell the difference between real and pretend. And what they've found is that if they get athletes to imagine themselves improving their performance, even if they don't do any more practice, like no physical practice, they just imagine getting better. 
they can actually see a, up to a 30% increase in athletic performance. So, you know, they've done tests like this on runners about how fast they get off the starting blocks when they start running. Um, you can tell I'm not a sports person. I don't know the terminology. <laughs> I just know the psychology. But, um, you know, they, they've done this, this research where they've found that just getting them to imagine it improves their athletic performance. It also works on healing the body. So they have done tests where, I don't know where they find these volunteers, but where they get people who are willing to get injured in the roof of their mouth. Um, and then they have a group that, you know, imagines their wound healing fast, uses their imagination. And they have a group that doesn't really do anything, the control group. And they've found, again, that, that number three, we love threes in witchcraft. So it's very easy to remember. About 30% um, people who did the, the healing meditation and imagined the wound healing healed about 30% faster than the control group. And that's fascinating because that's so just using your imagination to bring about change in your body and in the, in the world. And it's so interesting. I love information like that and studies like that because, I mean, it's so true. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I know it works for myself. So um, I, I imagine that it works in, in sports and healing as well. <laughs> that's right. Well, and I want to thank you so much for all of the information that you have shared today. Um, listeners, I'm going to have everything linked over at witchwednesdays.com so you can find uh, the website that we were talking about, uh, her Instagram, all of this information. And she has tons of great information to share, like a free mental health spell book. You have um, potions for anxiety and mini stress spells. There's all kinds of stuff mm -hmm. that you offer that I just love. So all of that will be linked. So thank you so much for being here and sharing everything that you have to offer. My absolute pleasure. Thank you for having me. And I really hope that this has made a difference for anyone listening with their mental health um, to know that, you know, witchcraft is powerful and that if you are struggling, that's okay. There are there's ways to reach out, get support. And there are things you can do yourself that can make a huge difference. So you're, you're a witch, you're powerful. You have the power. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> Great words of advice. And listeners, that is all that I have for you this week. I will see you next week. Need even more? Subscribe to Patreon and YouTube for exclusive bonus content. Order a themed witchcraft box every month through Witch Wednesdays on Etsy. Be sure to follow on Instagram at Witch Wednesdays Podcast. Find all these links and more at witchwednesdays.com.